Welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us today. We are in the educational technology uh, fall webinar series. And tonight we have a great presentation. Um, we are gonna be working on uh, aligning goals, aligning learning goals with ideal blended learning models with Joyce Ayin. And uh, Joyce is a doctoral student in the Educational Technology Leadership Program at New Jersey City University. This, is, um, this educational journey is part of her quest to become an expert in designing and facilitating learning in the 21st century for students. Joyce is currently a passionate middle school math teacher in New Jersey. She's also an adjunct in instructor at Essex County College, um, Newark, New Jersey. She also facilitates the first Lego League and Coder Z Junior League at the middle school level by allowing students to explore, be inspired, and be innov in innovative through an authentic STEM experience. So without further ado, we have a great lineup tonight, and I really hope you enjoy it. I'd like to turn it over to Joyce. Thank you. Thank you, Dana. Unfortunately, for the last five days, I have sounded like this. Today is the best you can hear me, so please um, just bear with me. The weather, the heat on and everything, this is how I'm sounding. So good evening and welcome to today's section of the NJCU4 webinar series. My name is Joyce Aim, and I've been introduced already, so I'll just go, home. I'll go on to the next slide, okay. So, Thank you for joining me to share some thoughts on how to align learning goals with ideal blended learning models. So this comes from my dissertation, which is on blended learning. So it's, um, it's generated from all the readings and all the activities that I've been going through as I'm gathering data for my dissertation. For the next 45 minutes, I will discuss what blended learning is, some of the main types of blended learning, why blended learning, the components that go into designing a learning experience, and finally setting and aligning the learning goals to the blended learning models. <clears throat> the last 15 minutes of this presentation will be for questions. By the end of this presentation, we will all gain valuable insights into the process of adopting online learning to benefit students and educators alike, while avoiding the missteps and potential pitfalls that we always find ourselves. So Michael Horn and Heather Staker, I have read so much about them in their book, Blended using disruptive innovation to improve schools. They noted that schools are approaching the tipping point in a digital transformation that will forever change the way the world learns. Because of this digital transformation, policymakers in education have to make strategic choices based on theoretical frameworks. And then based on that, we the teachers in the classroom have to focus on the innovations that would deliver the strategic choices more effectively. So we, the teachers who are at the forefront have a lot to do after all these policies have been um, put in place. Blended learning. Blended learning is one of the innovative, or one of the innovations educators are focusing on during this rapid era of digital transformation. So let's look at what it is. Why should we even be bothered about this type or this model of learning? Before we go on, I want us to take a look at this. Let's look at this. You can use the chat. I want you to um, select one of these choices. Would you rather buy item one or item two. <clears throat> I want you to note that item one has no descriptions, no labels, nothing on them, on it. And item two has everything describing what it contains. You can use the chat to, thank you. I apologize again for my voice, <laughs> keeps going in and out. 
All right, thank you. We have, yes, Colin says item two because I can read a label. Yes, yes, yes. So for health, thank you very much. For health reasons, I'm sure most of us would like to know what is in option one before we even buy, pay uh, for it. Even if it's very cheap, we still want to know. The same thing, our students will be more engaged and they will benefit more if we, the educators, understand the makeup of the instructional methods that we choose and use in our classrooms. So what is blended learning? There are three parts to the definition. First, blended learning is any formal education in which the student learns at least in part through online. The second part is that the student must attend a physical school away from home with a teacher or the facilitator in the classroom. And the third part of the definition is that there should be an integration across the modalities. That is data from the online learning must be used to update the in-person learning plan for the students. These are the three parts to the definition of blended learning. Let's look at some scenarios to help us. And I want you to use the chat again to say whether it is or not. So yes or no. So scenario one, in this scenario, Jane, who is an eighth grade student has access to all her schoolwork on Google Classroom. The teacher posts all the assignments and quizzes in Google Classroom. Jane completes her, her assignments in school and at home on a laptop or iPad. Please use the chat. What do you think about scenario one? Do you think this is blended learning or not? Yes or no? Just yes or no, yes, no. Yes or no, yes or no. Okay, we have some few answers here, okay. All right, this scenario is not an example of a blended learning. It is an example of a technology rich instruction, but then it is not blended learning. Remember, we have to have all the three components, online learning, there should be supervised brick and mortar location, the classroom, physical classroom, and integration of the learning experience. These three have to come together all the time. We will look at another scenario, scenario two. In this scenario, Mike learns from home and connects virtually with his teachers and classmates, but not face-to-face -face on campus. Mike is a full-time virtual student. Is a full-time um, is a virtual classroom, a blended learning um, instruction. Yes or no? Let's try this again. Scenario two. No, we have some no's here. No, Katie. All right. Okay, thank you, yes. Mike, in this case, is a full-time virtual school student. This is not blended learning. Virtual school is not blended learning because we have the online components, but we don't have the brick and mortar where the student is physically in a classroom with a teacher face-to-face. -face. And the last one is scenario three. John enjoys playing cool math games online. His face-to-face -face math teacher. Oh, in his face-to-face -face math class, John's teacher who has no idea of the games he has been playing is impressed with his ability to recall his math facts. The question is, is this blended learning? I'll just go on and I'll say that this is not because the data is not being collected. The data from the games is not being used to set up his learning plan in the classroom. The integration part 
is not there. The teacher has no idea. The teacher did not assign these. The student plays it on his own. He has get, uh, gotten better in it. But then because the teacher does not have that, that data to inform the instruction when they meet face to face, this does not satisfy as a blended learning as well. So the three parts is very important and we will come back to it um, as we go on. All right, so we are moving on. The components, let's remember again, the three components of what blended learning is, is that there should be online learning, there should be some offline collaborative activities when they meet with a teacher and the teacher should be right there with direct instruction as well. Blended learning is rather an intentional combination of online learning, offline learning in the form of collaborative activities and direct teacher instruction. These three come together to form what we call blended learning. So we're moving on. And according to Horn and Staker, there are hundreds of blended learning programs across this country. But let's look at some of the main ones that um, most of us in the K to 12 education will come across. These models can be grouped into two main types. We have the sustainable, which is the hybrids, and then we have the disruptives. The hybrids are mostly the rotational models. They allow the students to rotate through stations on a fixed schedule. One of the most important or the popular ones that we know is the flipped classroom model. It is um, where the traditional classroom is flipped. In this model, the student learns at home, online, doing the coursework, the major work is done online at home. And in the classroom, the, te the teacher acts as a guide to practice the skill that was learned at home, as well as to work on projects. So the flipped classroom, which is a popular thing that most of us would know, is an example of the sustain or hybrid model. When we go to the disruptive model, these models also combine technology and a traditional classroom. But it is very impossible to see or to find out where the blackboard or let's say where the front of the classroom is. When you enter one of these disruptive models, the setup is totally different. You wouldn't really see the teacher standing in front of the classroom doing any instruction like, um, or rather the instruction is in the form of the teacher acting like a facilitator. The teacher provides support and instructions on flexible basis based on what each student's needs are. So even the furniture and such of the, um, the disruptive models, the layout is totally different from how most of our classrooms are uh, presently where you see all the students facing one way. In the disruptive models, it's mostly not like that. For instance, the flex model, it lets the, the students move um, among learning activities according to their needs. So they come in and they decide where to do, which assignments to work on. The teacher just provides the support and instructions on a flexible base is like as needed. When the child needs it, then the teacher will work with them. When we go to the a la carte, it's, like, it's a French word. These enable the students to take on online courses with an online teacher of record. And then in addition, they have a face-to-face -face course. Most of these take uh, place in high schools where a particular course is not offered, but the child needs it to go there, to go into a, a college. So the, the school will have the student do it online, but then the student still comes to class for the other courses that the school um, has enrolled as students in. 
When we go on to the enriched virtual model, it is an alternative to a full-time online school. It allows the student to complete most of the coursework online outside of the school. And instead, the student attends the school for a required face-to-face -face section with the teacher. So the, the student is learning on their own, they do everything on their own, but from time to time, they're required to come in and meet with a teacher face-to-face. -face. These are the main three uh, mod, um, types under the disruptive models. And when you think about this, I want you to think about the electric cars that are disruptive now, and then we have the hybrid cars, which still has the gas and the electric combination. I want you to look at these um, in that way. I know it's a lot of information, but we will share this with you. So why blended learning? And we can all see it on the screen. I will just mention a few. Uh, blended learning, when you use it as an instructor, it helps you to differentiate and also be consistent. You know, you don't want to differentiate and leave parts of the skills out um, for certain students. But when you use blended learning, because you can assign different parts of the skill on different levels to students, they will all be working on the same skill at the same time. You don't have to really check um, whether I assign this or not, but you know they're all working on the same skill online. So it keeps you, it gives you that consistency in your activities. It motivates the students. The students can access it anywhere, anytime with any device. It increases the student's engagement. And in the long term, it is cost efficient for most of these institutions and even the students. Most students are doing online now because it's, it's much cheaper than the face-to-face. -face. So a blended learning is still in play when we talk about cost. Another, um, I've been reading, uh, you know, it's a lot of reading of late for some of us. So Julie Dexton in her book, Design for How People Learn, noted that the best learning experiences are designed with a clear destination in mind. This is bringing us over to the learning goals. We are not going to um, actually develop learning goals today but we are going to concentrate on how to align these learning goals um, with the uh, ideal blended learning models. So we will go on and we will look at the components that go into designing learning experiences. Let's take a quick look at these. First, it's important to know the problems you intend to solve. This will help you to identify some of the possible solutions. So if I know the problem I want to solve, then I can start thinking about some of the um, possible solutions that are out there. The second is to set a destination by creating simple but specific learning objectives. These are different from learning goals. By answering some questions such as, is this something the students will ever use in real life? Can I tell when the students have done this? Can I tell when the students have really achieved or been able to perform what I'm expecting them to do? You can also, the third thing is to identify the gap between where the student is currently and where you want to lead them to. Um, that is where they are now and how proficient you want them to be. The fourth thing is to recognize that if the skills you're trying to teach is a knowledge, is a knowledge skill, this is a skill that is fast learning. You can teach someone how to add, how to subtract. This is a knowledge skill. So you can teach it fast. When it is a foundational or attitude skill, it's normally learned slowly. So you need to know decide how far you are able to go on this particular topic. Going through these steps help us to set specific learning goals 
for our students. Your learning goals, well, learning goals in general allows educators or instructors and their students to focus on what they are learning. Always set SMART goals, goals that are measurable, attainable. You can measure it, you can reach them, and you like have a value most of the time when you set these goals, have a timeline and a value. That's how to align these learning goals um, to the ideal blended learning models. So I took these um, questions that we're going to be going through we're going to ask ourselves six questions. And as we answer these questions, we will be um, leaning towards particular models that um, answer our questions. And th these will tell us that, oh, we are leaning towards either the sustainable or we're leaning towards the disruptive models. So we will look at the first question. And I took these questions from um, Han and Staker from their book, and I put them in an algorithm form just to help me. So um, we will look at them one after the other. The first question is for us to ask our, ourselves as teachers, what problems we're trying to solve here? You can either be trying to solve um, a core problem, which is something to do with just your classroom or department or even a school wide. Or you might be thinking about something which is more non consumption, so problems. So it's two different things. Is it something that is within the school or something that is outside the school reach? Something that you will need a third party to help you with. So it is important to match the model to the type of problem. If the problem you seek to solve is a core one, such as disparity in um, reading skills, then you are looking at the hybrids. If it's a problem which is uh, non-consumption, such as a uh, student bringing up their, um, their SAT scores, because the SAT is not um, an exam that the school actually um, organizes on their own. So it's a third party. In this case, then you're looking at a non-consumption um, problem, which will be pushing you towards the disruptive models. And these, as I said, I took these questions and I just put them um, in this algorithm form from Horn and Staker, and I have it and that there, we can share it with you. You can look at this um, reading on your own later. The next one, the next wow. question that you can ask yourself. So after the first question, you have an idea where you're moving towards. The second is to look at the type of team that you will need to solve this problem. Do you need a functional team? Do you need a lightweight, like you need a department to help you? Do you need a heavyweight where you need the whole school or you just need the autonomous team which you can use uh, Khan Academy, you can go to any of this, um, what do they call this other, there is, is it Kunta? Yes, one of there's all these um, different, different uh, third party uh, online resources that can help you with your blended learning. So the problem, um, the specific, if the problem is specific to your class, your department or the school, you're looking at the sustainable, uh, the sustaining models. If it's something outside the reach, then you're going more to the autonomous or disruptive models that we're talking about. And then three. So once you get to the third question, you, you're still looking at this. And the, the third question is, what do you want your student to control? What, what do you want, what part do you want your students to play in your class? In this learning, what do you want them to do? So do you want them to control their pace and their path just for the online portion? Or you want them to control every part of the learning? 
the face to face, the online, and everything. So if you are thinking about having your students control the online portion, then you're thinking you're moving towards the sustaining models. And if you have confidence in your students, let's say high school students, and you know these students can do things on their own, whether you're there and all, or you're not there, then you're moving towards the disruptive models. So as we go through these um, algorithms, you know, we can put them all together. We will be um, narrowing down what exactly that our students need. And one thing we do is we forget that we are also, um, we are all part of the learning process. So we, the teachers, we have to ask ourselves, what do you want your primary role to be? What do you want to be? Do you want to just deliver face-to-face -face instruction? Then you are going towards the sustaining model more with the rotations. If you want to provide face-to-face -face tutoring, guidance, enrichment, supplement to the online lessons, then you're looking at the flipped classroom, which is also a sustaining one. And if you want to, um, some of the disruptive ones too, also offer the face-to-face -to -face tutoring guidance at the same time. But if you want to serve as an online teacher of record, you are sort of a tutor. You don't, you don't really teach that students on a regular basis, but once in a while, then you're going to the disruptive, which is the a la carte. Otherwise, you're staying more like a teacher or a facilitator, and you're doing the disruptives, the disruptive, which is the flex and rich, and then the flip classroom and the rotations. So when you ask the question for yourself as a student, as a teacher, the only one that is really moving off is uh, when you think of the a la carte, where you're just a teacher of record. Then that one, you know, you're shifting a bit out of what the others are all doing, which is face-to-face -face tutoring, guidance, enrichment, or direct instructions. The fifth question you will ask yourself is because I like the fourth question that very much because now we the teachers come in, our experiences to come in. How do what do you want to do? What part do you want to play? Number five, what physical space can you use? Because you trying to use blended learning does not mean you're going to pull down your classroom and build it in a different way for you. So you have to think about the physical space that you have available. If you just have your existing classroom and a computer lab, then you are going to the sustaining models. If you have an open space, you have the cafeteria that you can use, you know, whatever is available to you, because we have to remember that we are just, we're not, we're blending, we're not like doing away with everything just to do online, but we're bringing them together. So look at what is available to you in your school, in your district, and decide, try to align them correctly instead of thinking of you choosing something that later on you cannot fit into the building where uh, you're operating. And the last one is how many internet enabled devices are available to you and your students? Do you have enough for a fraction of the students? Then we are going towards the sustaining models, which is more of the rotations if we have enough for students to have one-on-one -on -one in class and at home, then we are doing flipped because if the students are doing the flipped classroom, they're learning more, at, they're doing all the learning at home. And in the classroom, we're doing more of hands-on activities. And then if you have enough, um, you have enough for all students during the entire class period, then you can think of the disruptive um, which is the flex model as well. These six questions, I call them like my magic questions. If I'm thinking about any, um, any group of students, if I'm thinking of moving them into a blended learning setting, 
these three or six questions guide me because as I answer them, it tells me, it shows me directly. When I have this printed out and I look at it, I see exactly where I'm moving towards because we have different sets of students. We have to acknowledge that. And our students are different in every way. Like we cannot say, I have about three classes and they're all totally different. So sometimes I have to change my lessons, although I'm teaching the same thing. And I'm sure most of us can relate to that. So having these six questions will help us because after we answer these questions, your answers will form the assumptions upon which you are basing your selection of the blended learning model. It's not just going to be, I'm doing FIP model because it's popular. You're doing it based on something. You answer these questions relating to your team, the student experiences, the teacher experiences, and the hardware and facilities that are available to you. Finally, I just want to say one thing. I want to say that always align your learning goals to an ideal blended learning model that is available to you so that you can create the learning experience that you want for your students. If none of these work for you, you as the teacher, you have the ability to create one for yourself. You can even name it after yourself because it's not, you know, when I did these readings, I realized that blended learning is not something like just all these um, methods and that's it. No, you can do it, but do it based on principles, not just because somebody is doing rotation, so I'm doing it. If you need to blend them, blend them. You can have half of the class doing rotation, half of them doing flip classroom. Just blend it. Whatever, you know, I don't know how to really express this, but whatever feels good for you and your students, don't stick to one thing because everyone is doing it. Come up with your own innovations and share it with all of us. Some of us are looking at this and we hope that one day we can also bring out something that we can share with everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for sharing that and that inspiring, that inspiring punch in the arm. We appreciate it. This was wonderful and such a, a relevant topic, especially with uh, the climate of how education is and, and the necessity for a variety of differentiation and in, in tactics and techniques. Um, I just want to open up the floor. I believe at this time we can um, take some questions. Yes. Um, we have our work study student with us, Amelie. Do we have any uh, questions in the chat? No, I don't see any questions related to this, but there is a few questions for you. Wonderful. Please feel free. If you, um, you would you like to read them through? Yeah. So Dana, the question is for you. Is talking about um, if there are any certificates for these meetings that we have. Ah, uh, yes, we were discussing this a little earlier. So um, that's a good thing that we brought it back up just before we end for the day. Um, we are discussing doing some certificates for um, for these as well. So I know we received an email through admissions from um, from participants. So we'll be getting that information shortly. Uh, I'm going to put my email in the chat if you um, attended today um, and feel free to message me. Um, have any questions about that as well but we'll be following up probably in the next week or so with some more information about that thank you so much thank you very much everyone i am so thankful that you stayed with me with my voice like this <laughs> so whatever is going on with me thank you so much i will share the link to this presentation with dana and if any of you need it she can also share it with you certainly Joyce, so, we do have a few more questions coming. Yes. Up. Yes. Let so, it. one of the questions are: Are there websites or digital resources you recommend to help with blending learning? Yes, there is a website called the Blending Learning uh, Blended Learning Institute (BLI), and there is a vast um, 
amount of information there um, for N is, so I think I would just put that in, is the Blended Learning Institute. And if you just Google that, yes, yes. It gives you so much information there. And I think that is um, one of the main resources that um, I go to most of the time. There's so much, so much studies there that you can read through. So many uh, research there. It had tons of information all on blended learning. Thank you. And another question is, uh, do you find any of the models work better for certain grades? All right, so I use <clears throat> I use the rotation and I use the uh, flipped um, classroom. I use the flipped classroom only for my algebra one students because if you use the flipped classroom with students who do not do homework at home, there is no way they will study at home. So you have to know the type of students. Knowing the type of students is very important. My algebra one students always seem to be very, you know, they're always very fast. They want to do it. They want to do it. So these students, I do the flip with them. But at the beginning of the year, I inform the parents. I inform the parents to let them know students are not just doing homework. They're learning. They have to do it. And then you have to make sure that whatever you assign, you can see whether the students did the, um, the learning before coming to class. And Khan Academy is a great way. You can assign um, anything there and see when the students are done it before they come to class the next day. The rotation is good for any type of student um, once you see them every day. That's good too, yep. So I use these two most of the time. It's hard when there is a lack of technology. Yes, yes. So it's very important to ask yourself um, question number five, which is talking about the devices that are available to you. If you don't have enough for all the students, then you're doing more of the rotation so that at any point in time, you have a set of students using the technology and then they rotate to give way to the other students as well. Thank you so much. I think that seems to wrap it up. So um, thank you so much, Joyce. This was wonderful. And thank you to everybody else. Um, we'll have another session on um, uh, Thursday. It's going to be about uh, digital storytelling and student empowerment. So please feel free to join us at six o'clock for that session. In the meantime, I wish everyone a wonderful evening. Thanks again for joining us.